grateful to the American Academy of Ophthalmology for the honor of presenting the 2016 Charles Capens Lecture. The title of my presentation is Management Options for Vitreo Macular Traction, Use an Individualized Approach. Uh, the management options uh, will be demonstrated with patient examples, but I'd like to show the pathology at the beginning of this uh, presentation. Here you see the relationships between the vitreous, which is still attached at the foveal center. This distortion of the foveal anatomy results in distortion and loss of vision for patients. So today I hope to address what are the best individual strategies for patients. Before I get into this presentation, I want to recognize Dr. Charles Scapins. The uh, picture on the left uh, shows Dr. Scapins in his military uniform. After medical school graduation in 1935, he enlisted in the Belgian Medical Corps. He received training abroad in London at Moorfields Eye Hospital as well as in Utrecht, Holland. He worked with Professor Vive, a, dis a disciple of Jules Conan regarding retinal detachment surgery. Dr. Scapins practiced ophthalmology and general medicine in Brussels prior to the start of World War II. And after his country was invaded, he joined the Belgian and French resistance and continued uh, working uh, uh, with uh, these organizations. He aided countless people to escape from Nazi-controlled France to Spain, and he returned to London in 1943 for further training in ophthalmology. The ophthalmoscope was originally described by Ruti in 1852 and later by uh, Gerard Toulon in 1861. Dr. Scapins revised and made the indirect ophthalmoscope clinically useful. He scavenged scrap metal and glass from the London bombings in World War II and modified the instrument to be used to examine patients. On the left, you can see the sketches of him examining patients, and on the right is the original prototype of his instrument. The instrument underwent revisions, and in 1946, Dr. Scapins presented a paper on the indirect ophthalmoscope at the American Academy of Ophthalmology in Chicago. He moved to the United States uh, in 1947 and became a research fellow in Boston at the Howe Laboratory of NAS Ioneer Infirmary. On the right, you see the modern indirect ophthalmoscope, and Dr. Scapins has the original on his left. So let me describe some of his accomplishments. One slide is not enough to describe all of these. He started the first Retina Fellowship. He founded the Scapins Eye Research Institute in 1950. He used encircling scleral buckles in 1953. He founded the Retina Society in 1963. He was voted one of the 10 most influential ophthalmologists of the 20th century in 1999. He received the American Academy of Ophthalmology Laureate Award in 2003 and the French Legion of Honor Award for his heroics in World War II in 2006. And perhaps most importantly, he trained hundreds of retinal surgeons worldwide, and trainees of these original fellows uh, have now uh, occupied uh, major positions in ophthalmology. At the Retina Society in 1994, Dr. Scapins was given the Founders Award, and it was my great privilege, along with Felix Sabates, to present uh, this award to Dr. Scapins.
Let's go now to vitreo macular traction. This video shows the relationships between the vitreous and the fovea. At first glance, you might think that the attachment is simply attached to the fovea alone. But with further examination, you see that there is a broad vitreo macular traction uh, causing distortion. So this uh, evaluation is important in deciding how to manage patients. The International Vitreo Macular Traction Study Group classified VMT based on OCT imaging. This paper was published in Ophthalmology in 2013 and is important as we move forward in our understanding and classification of VMT. Vitreo macular adhesion was simply elevation of the cortical vitreous above the retinal surface with remaining attachment within a three millimeter radius of the fovea. Vitreo macular traction is defined by anatomic changes within the contour of the foveal surface as illustrated on the right picture. So what are the management options for vitreo macular traction causing distortion and visual loss for patients? These include vitrectomy, pneumatic vitreolysis, pharmacological vitreolysis, and observation. The first is pars plana vitrectomy. In this approach, standard three-port small gauge pars plana vitrectomy is used to uh, remove the posterior cortical vitreous and relieve traction on the fovea. A 69-year-old woman with vitreo macular traction in the left eye and 2050 visual acuity. At four months following surgery, you can see the anatomy has returned to normal and visual acuity has returned to normal in this patient. There are a number of papers published on vitrectomy for vitreo macular traction. Uh, you can see on the left column, these papers go back to 2001 and uh, more recent series published in 2010, and visual improvement on the right side shows that the majority of patients uh, achieve uh, uh, an improvement after surgery. Let's look at a few more examples. Here is an 84-year-old female who presented with decreased vision in her left eye. Preoperative visual acuity was 2070 with a broad adhesion and subretinal fluid present in the macula. At three months following surgery and relief of the traction, visual acuity returns to 2020, although there is still some uh, distortion and abnormality of the ellipsoid zone. This is an 81-year-old female who presented with decreased vision in the left eye. Preoperative visual acuity was 2400, because of prominent vitreo macular traction, cystic change in the macula, and subretinal fluid. At post-op day 14, vision had improved to 2300 after relief of traction, but it took uh, a year uh, for marked resolution of subretinal fluid. Here we see at month 11, vision improved to 2100, but there's still some small amount of subretinal fluid remaining. Uh, this patient is, is illustrated here with 18 month follow-up vision improved and uh, the subretinal fluid has resolved. What about outcomes with vitrectomy for uh, vitreo macular traction from Bascom Palmer. We reported a series of 41 patients uh, in 2015. 56% of eyes improved by one or more lines and the traction was released in all cases. However, there were complications. Four patients, or 9.8%, developed a macular hole and three of the four underwent additional surgery with successful closure of the macular hole. 
The second option for management of vitreo macular traction is pneumatic vitreolysis. This involves injection of a gas bubble which expands and causes uh, release of the vitreo macular adhesion. Here is a, an example, a 79-year-old male with vitreo macular traction and 2070 visual acuity. In the middle photographs you see one week following uh, or two weeks following uh, injection of gas. There's still a bubble above but the traction has been relieved and by month three visual acuity has improved to 2030 in this patient. Pneumatic vitreolysis for relief of vitreo macular traction was reported uh, by Dr. Chan and Associates in 2017 uh, on EPUB. Uh, this retrospective review of 49 patients, a single injection of intravitreal C3FA gas was utilized. 35 of the patients had vitreo macular traction only, and 15 had a macular hole. Uh, successful release of vitreo macular traction was accomplished in 80% of the vitreo macular traction group, and 100% of eyes with stage 2 macular hole. Here is an example on the left, a 70-year-old female with vitreo macular traction and 2040 vision. At four months, vision has improved to 2030, and the traction on vitreo, our pneumatic vitreolysis is shown here. This was reported in Retina in 2016, a series of 30 eyes of 29 patients with symptomatic vitreo macular traction. At one month, the release rate was 73%, and at the final follow-up, it was 83%. The only complication that occurred was pupillary block in one patient who, uh, against medical advice, slept on their back and had a pupillary block. Uh, so another... Uh, report in Retina 2016 reviewed the treatment options for vitreo macular traction, and this was a meta-analysis of 23 articles, uh, and they looked at rates of vitreo macular resolution by, eight, by day 28. The saline injection group was 9%, the pneumatic vitreolysis group was 84%, and the ocuplasmin group was 26%. So this leads us into the third option for management, and this is enzymatic vitreolysis. Uh, and I will primarily discuss ocuplasmin, but there are alternative agents such as anti-VEGF agents and integrin antagonists that have also been reported. Uh, in this example, a patient on the left at 2025 visual acuity with distortion of vision you can see the focal vitreo macular traction, and at day uh, 14, the traction has uh, uh, improved and uh, released, but there's still cystic change in the macula with subretinal lucency. Uh, however, by month six, uh, the traction has been completely resolved and the anatomy has returned to with 2063 vision at baseline. At 14 days, uh, the traction is relieved, and by six months, the vision has slightly improved to 2050 after treatment with ocuplasma. There are a number of studies that have reported outcomes with ocuplasma. These include the MIVI Trust study, the ACES study and the ORBIT study. All of these patients uh, uh, had uh, follow-up in a control clinical trial. The details of these studies were presented at the Retina Society in 2016. Overall, there was a combined number of 1,100 subjects with symptomatic VMA enrolled into these three programs. Subjects were treated with a single injection of ocuplasmin 0.125 milligrams and followed for 6 to 24 months. The endpoints was pharmacologic 
resolution of VMA at day 28. This uh, slide <coughs> summarizes the outcomes of these studies. In the MIVI Trust study, there was an increased rate of release in the Occuplasmin group, 26.5% compared to 10% in the placebo group. The OASIS study likewise showed an increased rate of release at 41.7% compared to the sham group at 6.2%. The ORBIT study looked at Occuplasmin in a large series of 449 patients and the rate of release was 42.5%. In the Immaculate Society Collaborative Study Group, uh, authored by Lim and Associates, was presented at the Macula Society in 2016. This online survey of Macula Society members resulted in a total of 144 eyes with vitreo macular traction without macular hole. The Occuplasmin results at final follow-up showed release of traction in 45% of eyes. However, they were not infrequent, but usually transient side effects. Slide of side effects are reviewed on this slide. There can be acute structural and functional abnormalities after the use of Occuplasmin. These include acute loss of visual acuity, visual field constriction, attenuated retinal arteries, outer retinal spectral domain OCT lucency, severely reduced ERG, diffuse effect on photoreceptors, but these effects are usually but not always transient. On the right you can see a patient treated with Occuplasmin and the release was uh, accomplished immediately. However, you see the outer retinal lucency and a drop in visual acuity immediately after this treatment. A, in a uh, combined multi-center uh, study, Jackson and co-authors reported in Retina 2016 predictors of VMA, VMT resolution regard, uh, following Occuplasmin. The key predictors for resolution were VMA or VMT diameter of uh, 1,500 microns or less and the absence of an epiretinal membrane. So this, these factors are important in selecting patients for this treatment. What about costs? Doctors Chang and Smitty evaluated the costs for treatment uh, with uh, Occuplasmin compared to standard vitrectomy approaches. The cost per quality adjusted life years was $5,000 to $7,000 for vitrectomy, whereas Occuplasmin was more expensive at eight to $10,000 uh, of uh, quality adjusted life years. To be discussed today is observational management of vitreo macular traction. Here we see a patient whose right eye showed some vitreo macular adhesion but had 20 20 vision. In the left eye, visual acuity in 2013 was 20 40. Uh, spontaneous release of the vitreo macular traction occurred by 2015 and notice by 2016 visual acuity has returned to 2020 with no treatment. And notice also there was no alteration of the ellipsoid zone although there was some persistent cystic change within the retina. In this example, a 50-year-old male with a normal fellow eye presented with focal vitreo macular traction. Visual acuity was 20-30. Notice the loss of the foveal depression, but there was no cystic change or subretinal fluid. With follow-up of one month, the 
uh, traction spontaneously released and visual acuity was 2020 minus 2 with restoration of the foveal depression. Again, sure, you can see that there was uh, no alteration of the ellipsoid zone. In this example, a 77-year-old male with a fellow, no uh, fellow eye that was normal, visual acuity was 2040 with prominent vitreomacular traction. This was a so-called grade two vitreomacular traction without subretinal fluid. After two years of follow-up, <clears throat> visual acuity improved to 2020 with restoration of the foveal depression after spontaneous VMT release. This slide summarizes the course of vitreomacular traction managed by initial observation only. This report uh, was published in Retina in 2014 by John and co-authors. This was a three-center uh, uh, trial uh, involving observation only. The grading system in this study was uh, uh, as follows. Grade one was incomplete separation of the cortical vitreous, but with persistent vitreous traction. Grade two was all of grade one with any interretinal cyst, cleft, or schesis. And grade three was all of grade two plus neurosensory elevation of the retina from the pigment epithelium or subretinal fluid. Here are a few examples from that study. This 80-year-old woman with persistent VMT in her uh, eye had 2030 visual acuity in November of 2008. The patient was followed for eight years and had 20, 25 visual acuity in the eye, even though the traction has persisted. The only change was the patient undergoing cataract surgery so that the image is brighter and clearer. The course of vitreomacular traction managed by observation was expanded from three centers into six centers. This was reported in OSLI Retina in 2015 and included the anatomic outcomes of observation in 230 eyes at 18 months. For grade one eyes, the rate of release spontaneously was 23%. But many of the eyes, 60%, had no release and they were stable. And in the grade two, 32% underwent spontaneous release, but 58% remained stable. Grade three, remarkably, was 20 eyes, and 14 of these eyes, or 70%, underwent spontaneous release. So the more severe the grade, the more likely they were to have spontaneous release. But uh, they also were more likely to have a uh, need for vitrectomy or had a worsening grade, and that was at 10%. So in total, about a third of the eyes underwent spontaneous release. About half of the eyes remained the same and around 12% had worsening of the grade or had a vitrectomy at their 18-month follow-up visit. Acuity. For grade one, the mean uh, presenting visual acuity was around 20 over 48, and at last visit it remained stable. For grade two, similarly, it was around 2050 to 2060, and it remained stable at last visit. Grade three, because of the high rate of spontaneous release, had some improvement from 20 over 85 to 20 over 53. In this study of observational uh, management involving seven centers, the fellow eyes of macular, uh, patients with macular hole were not included. These were only eyes that did not have macular hole in the other eye. Most eyes underwent observation without treatment. 
but there were uh, 10 of the eyes, or 4.3 percent, that ultimately underwent vitrectomy. Six of the 10 were for the indication of macular hole, and five of these six were closed with vitrectomy. And four of 10 were operated because of worsening symptoms and worsening grade. And those are shown here. Here's an example of a patient who had a macular hole in the right eye. And back in 2012, she had surgery with successful closure of the hole and improvement in vision from 2200 to 2050. The left eye had vitreomacular traction, and this eye was observed, and spontaneous release occurred with restoration of 2020 visual acuity. So, what do we know about managing vitreomacular traction? It achieves consistent and predictable release of vitreomacular traction, but has a risk of postoperative macular hole, retinal detachment, and cataract progression. Vitrectomy is best used in eyes with epiretinal membrane and broader adhesions. Pneumatic vitreolysis may have the highest non-surgical VMT release rates and has a co high cost efficiency, that is utility value, because it only involves a gas bubble injection and no expensive equipment or uh, uh, pharmacotherapy, and this is best used for focal adhesions and the need for some patients to have a non-surgical option. Enzymatic vitreolysis with ocuplasmin has positive clinical trials data but has significant costs. It has not infrequent but usually transient side effects. This can be best used for focal adhesions and eyes with no epiretinal membranes. Observational management uh, is associated with spontaneous release of adhesions in about a third of patients and a low rate of macular hole formation. This is best used in eyes with better vision or patients who request non-intervention in their management. So what should we do? we should use an individualized approach to patients with VMT. We should consider the risks, benefits, and costs of these management options for each individual patient. We should consider the individual patient's visual needs and visual symptoms in deciding between observation and any treatment. We should consider the patient's individual general health, including cardiovascular disease requiring anticoagulation or any ocular disease that may be uh, increased after our treatments. Finally, we should consider the time requirements and imposition on family members to comply with more complex treatment options. I would like to acknowledge and thank the Retina Research Foundation the Charles Scapins International Society, Dr. Alice McPherson, the AAO Awards Selection Committee uh, for their uh, kindness in selecting me for this lecture. I would also like to recognize my fellow, Dr. Nidhi Batra, for her invaluable assistance in uh, preparing this presentation, and my family here today, Donna, Molly, Parker, and Lily. And most importantly, we uh, recognize the leadership and valuable innovations from Charles Scapins as a surgeon, educator, scient scientist, leader, and mentor.